Good morning. Good morning, class, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the installer. And when I'm doing this, you'll see, you'll see that this is a slide and not <laughs> the desktop, right? Because there's another mouse. But anyway, the first slide, the Arc OS installer. What I want to do is to try to give you some background about it. I'm not going through how it works when you are installing as Andy did yesterday, but just to give you some background about the way it was developed, some of the thoughts that came out, why we did it one way and not another way. Um, maybe you have some nice ideas because we will be enhancing the installer, we'll be changing things, so you have a chance to give us some input. Okay, the installer. Ah, <laughs> it takes a little while. I want to talk just about the graphical installer and the elements in there. Basically, the installer is made up of a number of elements. This is really quick. There's the pre boot process, which Andy described yesterday. There is the graphical installer itself, and there is the installation routine that is behind that. Uh, a little bit of history. In 2015, it was decided that for Arca OS, a new graphical installer should be made. Um, we did some preliminary designs, you know, as things often happen, they are very preliminary and things get changed. Initially everything was very vague. We didn't really know which way we were going to go, we were going to go left, we were going to go right. But in January 2016 I started coding the graphical installer. When I say started, put in the first lines of code. Exactly what it was going to be was still very, very vague. And of course the project grew. We had a team of people working on the installer. Alex Taylor, which you have met a number of times I think, he was basically doing the design. So what should it look like? What way would we do a number of things? David, he was helping out with some of the coding, certainly to introduce it into Arca OS itself. Myself, I was doing the real C coding. Everything was in C. And Lewis, some management, so how we're going to formulate certain things, how we're going to get it going, what it's going to look like. And of course, a lot of beta testers, when we had something that they could test, gave feedback about how it was working, what didn't work. The requirements, very simple. Guide the user through easy path to select everything using graphical wizard type options. It should also be very easy to modify. The installer basically comes in three modes. You will only see one. You have to pay for the rest. No, seriously. Mode 1, and this is what you all know, has a left panel and a right panel. The left panel being read-only, the right panel being anything we need to show you steps. Then we have mode 2, which is similar to mode 1. Left panel becomes now a navigationable list. And mode 3, we get rid of the left panel entirely. Let's have a look what it looks like. This was the first design 
of the mode one panel. So you see the left hand side, what is happening, and the right hand side, well, there could be anything there. For mode two, this left hand panel becomes a navigationable panel. We don't use this in the installer at the moment. Then we have mode three, which is even easier, just one big panel. If we have a look at the internal structure of the installer, basically the installer is script driven. The layout of each page is defined in a DLL. And anything that is selected is just passed on to um, a file for later use. So when you're going through the installation, everything you're clicking on and selecting is written to a file. Nothing is generally happening, although there are a few exceptions, of course. Every page, the data is stored and restored when the page is reselected. Um, you will probably find sometimes this doesn't go quite like you think it might, but this I will try and explain why. But I'll do that a little bit later. From the installer, there are a number of internal programs which will be and can be called because it is otherwise very difficult to only call external things to happen, although you want them to happen immediately. If you have any questions, just ask, because I see some blank faces, or you're just all tired. You're all tired. Okay, some of the consequences of this uh, method. If an error is reported anywhere, well, there was a big problem. Where did the error really come from? Did it come from the executable code? Did it come from the DLL code, which is designing the page? Or the script was telling the installer what to do is wrong. So this was great. And of course, it didn't mean that it was only in one place the uh, error, but they could all be combining to make an error. So debugging was fun. Another thing that sometimes happened, we had different interpretations of what we thought should be happening. So the design team says, we're doing it like this. I thought they meant it like that. And then you get something else. Um, the installer has a simple syntax, which looks like this. Just install, then the script name, which is the first script that it will execute. So if you type in install, it will start with the script start file one. Otherwise you put it in a script and you can start anywhere in the process. The mode which I've shown you, the various modes, one, two, or three. Size and position, well, you never will see this generally, but it is possible to say the size and position of the installer on the screen. And I'll show you that a little bit later on. We have a small test mode, which gives us some additions, such as showing the uh, add, the min, <coughs> and the maximum buttons. So if something's going wrong, you can minimize it to see what's in the background. Uh, you can also close the program if it's not behaving as it should. And we can also move it around on the screen. Those are just a little bit more. Plus, we have the ability to describe on the title line, which script is being used, which DLL. So it makes debugging easier because 
You don't always know what you're doing. And, well, we have the ability to put a log file anywhere we want. This is, of course, very necessary if you are uh, installing, because you can't write to the DVD, so you have to know where you're going to write information in case something is going wrong and you can look back later. This is the log only of the installer itself. If you have an error installing Arca OS, you get a list of logs. And depending on what has happened from all those logs, we can see where the problem is. Okay. To try and make things easy for the script writers, we made specific types of windows and buttons which we put in a resource file. Anything with IC number one, two, three, that replies to text. And if you understand anything about a resource file, you recognize left hand text, right hand text, group boxes, auto check boxes, and so on. We have data elements which are defined, and we have a list element. This way it was pretty easy to put stuff in a script and define exactly what it does. We also have text possibilities and basically it is a form of HTML text not fully HTML because we don't support all of the various things but basically what you see is bold and colors and size fonts if anything was not used within the script command we just had to refer to it with a negative number and then it's not used by the script or the program directly Okay, to give you some of ideas of what is in the uh, script itself, there are various items. The first one is called action, so somewhere in a script you start action and then either enable, disable and so on. I'm not going to go through all of them, but just to give you an idea of what was in the script itself. Um, these script items came into being as required. It is uh, basically how we're going to do something. Do we have something in the script that will cover that? If not, we define a new script command. And that's the way it's gone, basically. So, button, this defines the buttons at the bottom. And you can then define the text, which you then see as, um, let me think, what is it? Uh, previous, next, then a cancel or another or system management button and then the help button. Captions, comments, data, well these are all the items in the script file. One of the interesting items was help ID because when you press the help button you want to get some information on that page. So the help ID is used to select the particular page in your help file. So if you find anywhere on the installer that the help file is either not found or gives an error, that's because somebody put in the wrong ID. Simple as that. It's just a reference. So, here we go, all the various items. One of the things that always is in the script file is the module name. It has to know the layout of the page, so you have to tell him, well, I'm using that DLL. It also, the next script, so when you press the next button, which is the next script I'm going to use. So, it just follows then sequentially. The next script, however, is not necessarily only one item, but can be more, 
and will depend on what you've selected. So for example, if you have three buttons on the screen, the next script may have three entries. And just depending which button, it selects first, second, third entry. Uh, you saw yesterday, at a certain moment in time in the installer, you get a list of what has been selected and do you want to continue. And this is done by the status list, command, all those items that we think we should put in the list at the end to say this is what you've selected. We don't put everything in that list, only the important things. So you know I'm going to format that drive. I have selected that LAN. These sort of things. The task list refers to the left hand panel and which item. Text, what I talked about. Title just gives the title text, so on the page you know what's supposed to be happening. And that's basically all the script commands. There are, however, some internal commands which we use. <laughs> Simple one, exit terminate. This is on the maintenance page. When you press restart the installer, actually all it does is just call exit and stops the program. Now since in the installer it is running as the initial GUI, it will automatically restart if you just go out of it when you exit. Um, there was also a small um, discussion yesterday about the checks we have, for example, on IP numbers if it is formulated correctly and it is limited checking, we use these internal programs to do uh, the check, for example, on the um, host name and IP, the check IP, just to check that the IP criteria looks like an IP address. Disk information, this is when you see the pull-down screen with all the drives that you have. You just ask for this program and it gives the data back. List, uh, we have a few other internal programs. Uh, the file manager, so if you in fact open a file, uh, if you select for example the uh, ability to use a resource file, uh, oh, sorry, a response file, um, instead of going through and customizing everything yourself but just from a response file it would use this file manager just to select it. Font you saw on the first page because you saw the size of the installer, what font size are you using? Small, medium, large. We have a program which starts the hardware detection Somewhere along the line, in the installer, we need to find out what is the hardware. So in the scripts, it just calls this program, which then runs and detects all the hardware on the system. Normally, we set this in the very first page. This program runs in the background, so with a bit of luck, if you're slowly working through, the detections all happen when you eventually get to it where you're needing it. So it's the keyboard layout. That's also from the first page, you recognize it. Language, you didn't see this one because we can switch the language. Originally, and I will show you that uh, in the demo, we have the ability to switch languages. This will be future use. Uh, mouse command, well, you needed to be able to switch the mouse left, right, also from the first page. So a lot of stuff, uh, network, detecting network art. The progress ribbon. There's also an internal program. All it does is basically wait to get information from a pipe, and the pipe says 1%, 2%, and it just does it. Of course, the pipe is controlled, by the real installation process, which is in the background, and it's just filling the pipe with the information. Okay, 
the DLL. The DLL is itself in three parts, basically. It's very simple. There's no code in the DLL. We decided not to put any code in the DLL because we want. If anybody needs to modify it, they can do it in the script. The only thing the DLL is doing is saying, I'm going to have a button here, I'm going to have a list there, I'm going to have some text there. That's all it's basically doing. It's an RC file, a resource file. So you have RC, include statements and comments. We also have the window definition, so the buttons. And we have a string table. The string table gives what I call a positioning override. So we can define in the DLL exactly where some things are going to be. If we can't define it easily, directly, and this is basically being used for the situation for mode 3. So when the screen is smaller, or sorry, when the installer window is smaller than the screen, and you need to say, put the button, not physically there, but halfway in that box. But I'll show you on the demo. And we have a tab sequence table. Sometimes you want to be able to move using the tab from here to there to there, and not maybe what would directly come out of the RC file itself. So it allows you to override the particular actions. Well, the RC statements, well, something simple like include. Then the window definitions. For any of you who have made an RC file, this should look very, very familiar. So for example, and if I remember, yeah, this is the first page you see on the installer. The only difference is there's one extra drop-down list, which happens the language, which has <laughs> disappeared now. So that's basically the definition of the first page. Simple. Then we have the string tables. The first is the tab list. So for example, what I'm saying here, when you use the tab, you go to the button or anything that is defined as IC3, then ID1, then IC2, then IC1. It's just saying the order when you press the tab where the focus is going to move on the screen. Then we have the size table. This gets a little bit more complicated. But basically, uh, this code here is telling us what we're going to do. Are we going to be able to move it? Are we going to be able to resize it and so on? We have some multipliers. And we have some sizes. Now the sizes are basically 1,000th units of the screen size. So, in this case, the size is about 38% of the screen width, height, and then the positions. So in that way, we can define stuff to be able to move it if necessary. It's not used on every page. Any questions up to this moment? Where's the app? Sorry? Who's the app? Fixed. Where's the penny button? <laughs> there. You described running uh, sub-programs, for example, the yeah. manager. Uh, why were this manager just running? Is the installer frozen? It depends. Why is the installer program running in the background? Um, well, you saw yesterday, uh, at a certain moment in time, it's doing the uh, disk check, and then the program is frozen because you can't do anything until the check's been done. Most of the stuff is uh, done on separate threads, so it is uh, running concurrently. And that means that you're updating some file with states in the or error codes from running very Yeah, yeah. 
the, I think it's called system in the sea, um, driver if you're running an executable. Well, there are more, <laughs> but yeah. Part of the, the five or six varieties of yeah. the system, you get your return code back directly to the installer that initiated the program. Well. Yeah. What should you do about any other return? Uh, well, there, there are a number of ways you can call programs. Some of them are external programs. So, for example, I can uh, call just by uh, saying execute uh, external, um, what would you like, uh, a directory command. Eh? Now, sometimes it is possible to get the um, return code, sometimes it isn't. So you're, um, I'm interested in the architecture of how you're tossing the information between the independently run bits. If you, if, you, if you have a synchronous program, you, yeah. you, you know what's happening. You get the return code. Yeah. And there are various supervising things. Yeah. The program itself, another program could do, yeah. even while the other program is run. Well, what I try to do uh, generally is to use WinStart application. Yes. And uh, then you can wait on what's happening. It, it depends what exactly you're doing, whether you're going to have to wait or you're going to look at the data later. And you can say, well, I am assuming that there are no errors, or I can get an error code back, or my data is either good or wrong. It, it just depends exactly what you're doing. For example, if you're opening uh, in the maintenance mode, the last screen, and you call um, uh, a DOS window, you don't get any real code, but yeah, what are you going to do with them anyway? Yes, uh, I'm interested, do you have some overall architecture, your idea, I can handle all this in a consistent way, or do you ever <laughs> come to a new program and think, how am I going to get the information? Well, you know? uh, no, uh, most stuff, in fact, is, is done in the same way. In programs that I can use with WinStart app, I get the return codes and I can do everything I want with them and give errors if necessary. If you have to start it uh, with a start, uh, start, sorry, with a start session, then it becomes far more complicated. We have pipes, yes, but that's only used to get, for example, the progress indicator. We're going to implement later on another pipe, which is going to be giving you information during the progress, which is showing exactly what's happening. Okay. There's a question on IRC. Oh. If the original IBM installer is involved in the station process of IRC. In the at the end of the installer, or put it this way, once we get to the page where the progress starts, all the information of the selections has been passed into a file. That file is then used by a background process to do all the installation. Exactly what is involved there, I don't know. I'm only doing the gooey part, the sticky bit. Yeah? Okay, now we try the switch. I can add something to that uh, question. I've seen the installer run yesterday. Yeah. I've seen the installer run yesterday, and yes, you do see remnants of the IBM installer in the window task list popping up. So it's using them in the background. Yeah. I saw yesterday. Actually, uh, Alex Taylor is uh, replying here on ISC that uh, he says yes, specifically as the install exit. So that's okay. That's at the end. Yeah. Okay. So, here you see the installer, and this is the mode 3 version, and then we have the ability to resize. And basically I, I just put some text in here. You remember you had the free trial software on uh, Ecom station, and you had then similar page to this, and then you would go and do some stuff. So what I'm showing here is just a little bit of what you could do, very simply. For example, you then select some programs, and then they could be installed. 
help gives me an error because I did not define the help file ID to be used. So what you see very simply, all right, this is now difficult because I have to look here, is if I want, I can define the installer to be do using or to be doing slightly different things than what you've seen up till now. This was the initial first page which we were going to use for the installer. Um, the text, of course, is uh, just holding text in this case. And what you see is now, I, I can't move it around. Uh, what you also see is here we have the language and just to show that it does work, we can switch languages and it switches if I, the help files as well. So it is already there, we just have to implement it and we will implement that of course when we bring out various versions of the uh, Arca OS uh, languages. Close this down. What you're seeing here at the bottom of course is because I'm running the installer and this is the, uh, what do we call it? The e-center, e yeah. Let's. So here you see, let's put that in the background. The maintenance page. This was just uh, some ideas which we just threw in to show that you could add um, menu items. So depending on uh, what we thought would go in the maintenance page, simply for now the script we just put as a list on that script page. And then, for example, I'm not sure if this will even work, oh yes it does. Uh, this is where we say execute, and I execute, for example, the 4OS2 command window. I keep looking at the wrong screen here. <laughs> it's most confusing. You see, now when I say exit, it, it really does exit because it's not the screen, it's not the, what do we call it, the uh, initial uh, okay. open screen, the, uh, it's not the shell that's running initially, basically. Let's, Then I have to say run. <laughs> I made a mistake in my uh, syntax, uh, so you see it even checks that. But basically, you are seeing a little bit, it's given all well a version number, but I go back. I use my test program, it's just as easy. In the test program, I'm also using the uh, slash test option, so you see here the script, which DLL it's using. So when I went on to the next page, I'm using a different DLL, and this is the name of that particular script file. Let me see if I can do something. Or well, I'll stop there, I think, unless you have any questions. I can show you the scripts themselves. But you can look at them yourself. When you have Arthur OS, go and have a look on the DVD and you will find where the installer is and you will see the DLLs and you will see the script files so you can see how it works. 
Any questions? Was it interesting? Yes. We have to read it. Thank you. You were using separate DLLs for each thing. Right. Yes. Uh, that was to get the RC file boxed neatly in one place. Well, that was to get, because every page has a different layout. That's the problem. And what we wanted is that somebody could very easily say, well, um, I'm right over there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want an extra button. So from the RC file, you're just defining the buttons and where they are, and if necessary, especially in the other modes, you can say, this button, I can resize, reposition. I showed you just in the um, this little test that it moves these buttons, it doesn't resize them, but if necessary, I can do exactly the same. I can put the information in to resize the buttons. Sometimes you don't want to move them, sometimes you want to resize them, sometimes reposition them. So the decision about the DLL was to have identifiable con configuration management units that that guy wants. He wants yeah, to have, uh, yeah. And to keep it simple, because uh, if, if, you, if anybody's done any answer, any programming, uh, graphical programming on OS2, you use the RC files, resource code files. We've kept them simple just to say, this is a button, this is text, and so on. And so anybody can basically design that page. So if you wanted to fit the button in your program? Yeah, you just go in the DLL, or go in the RC file, and you say, that's the button. And I recompile the DLL. Obviously, in the script file, you're going to have to say, the text on that button should be this. And that's the way it works. Any other questions? Now's your time. What we say at marriages? Forever hold your peace. Yes? And what was the reason to, uh, to have a new installed? Uh, basically, we were not allowed to use the old one. And we wanted it to be flexible. Uh, because the old installer did it completely different, well, not completely differently, it did it differently. And there was a lot of code in the DLL. So for example, if you went to a particular page where you were using, um, uh, what do we call it? The, um, not part manager, the uh, formatting of your disk. So you can s select which partition you want to use, what size and so on. That was previously all in the DLL which meant it was very difficult to change it. We, we, we have changed it completely and tried to put everything in the script. One of the things we also have on the script is that if you execute a program, you can only execute it once, for example. Because, let me... This run. This doesn't quite look the same. Oh, I forgot one little thing which you might want. Don't worry about this license, it's just, that was just rubbish. Um, and you see this page is completely different from what you've seen yesterday. But what most people don't know, including Andy, where's Andy? You can use F5 to go through. <laughs> Here you see the integrity check. Now, sorry it takes so long. And you see this layout is different from what you've now seen. These were, basically, I made these pages just to test that we could do certain things, not as it actually would be in the end. And the unfortunate thing about the disk integrity check is it takes damn long. Okay. So, let's go back. If I go forward again, it doesn't happen. But as we said, you can only execute this program once. So that you can also do in the script. So the script has, is, is very powerful. And according to Alex, he likes it. And since Alex basically did all the scripting, 
he's the guy who should say it's nice or not. Okay. Yes, my friend. Yes, why is the installer uh, makes user input so much options? Why? It doesn't. It depends what you select. You saw yesterday, install, if you if you just... To install connected Windows, I should simply press the buttons. And here. Um, and here. Yeah. 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 In Windows, you also have to select where it's going to be, the, the, the software is going to be installed, correct? Yes, well, you, that's what you do here. And if you took the, um, there's a small bug here, but if you took the uh, simple, the single personality, I have to go back, this is a slightly older version, but it doesn't matter, and you said, okay, I'm taking that, well, in this case, <laughs> it's very simple. But there were very few options. Obviously, you want to define maybe whether you want the ACP or not. It, it, it's a, a decision that the user can either keep it simple, if he wants simple personalities, or he can do everything he wants. It, <coughs> that choice was made. That was a, a, a management choice to be able keep it simple, or if you want, do all the options yourself. Yeah. That's what most people want to do, all the options. The generated file, can it be used to install a lot of machines at one go? Theoretically, yes. I mean, the, what, what this program does is just generate an export file of all your selections. So if you use that export file and just feed it into the back end, if you like, you do all the machines in exactly the same way. Why not? But of course, the only problem is they all have to have identical hardware. Otherwise, you start getting problems with trying to install something on that machine which that machine doesn't have. But of course, you can do it that way. Why not? Can you store the data file? But is, is it the text that the user is entering? Would you store that and rerun it through the installer? Or do you have a binary version? <sighs> Behind it. Okay, so proprietary version. Basically, what happens? Everything I select, only if it's selected, I write to the export file. I can show you maybe if. How are we doing for time? Um, your time's about up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, any more difficult questions? My time is almost up, guys. Um, let's. Okay, um, let me. Try and show you. I'm hearing it from the audience, and you know it's Sunday morning, so people really need their cup of coffee. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. uh, yes. And some people are jet lagged coming from California and are beginning to be hammered. <laughs> yes, last night I did that temporary. This is just come from the first page. So what you see is. The first page we have defined as user preferences. Then we have said, well, the mouse is the right hand mouse. The keyboard is the keyboard code. Uh, font is size small and language is English. The license we did, so we know that's been agreed upon, and the installation type was simple. So the export file is the file you read. Yes. Put out the summary. Do you really want this to do? No, 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 no. This is the file that is used to run the real installation in background. Um, these names, user preferences, for example, that is defined in the script file as we're going to call this user preferences. And the second mouse is going to be for the mouse button. So that's the way it's working. So all that goes into the back file, also the export file, and is used. The other file, well it's not a file, internally in memory, everything you select that we think is important is defined in the script, but oh, remember that, and on the status page, show it. That's the way it's working. One last question, or I... Yes? If we have to show slides during installation, this information, what is new in your course? Uh, what was in Windows 95 or what before? I know what you 
you're saying, uh, that was done there. Uh, what we've been doing, and I've only been doing... Can you talk about the microphone? Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, that, to start with, was not my decision. I don't say... We, we, we basically just wanted to be able to get an installer out and running. Um, we uh, had not done a Windows lookalike. Why should we? I understand what you're saying, the new features, but that we can summarize in another way. It may be something which is uh, as an idea to be used later, I don't know. But we don't want to emulate Windows, do we? <laughs> exactly. Okay, gentlemen, lady. <laughs> that was it. So I hope I've been given you a little bit of background about the installer. It will change the next version, I'm sure. We're going to add some more things, as I said, for example, during the progress that you really see what's going to happen during the progress and not just getting, it's 1%, it's 2%, it's still hanging on 2%. Yeah? So there will be more things and improvements and hopefully less bugs. Thank you.